I'm Coach Pete of Math Coach Me. I offer math coaching and tutoring services, and I also offer free interactive, interactive lessons at my mathcoach.me site. This is the fifth lesson in my trigonometry series. We're going to take a look at graphing the sine function and its reciprocal cosecant function. Unique to my approach is the use of Desmos graphing calculators like the one we're seeing here. Desmos is an exceptional tool for, for learning about math, for exploring math, uh, particularly visual math like trigonometry. Tr trigonometry is certainly a very visual topic. Also unique to my approach is there is a free lesson at my mathcoach.me site for, for this particular video lesson. So you can go there and you can interact with these calculators to, directly. And I'm just going to set a value of 30 degrees or pi over 6. So when I set this angle in my unit circle to 30 degrees, then the sine is the sine of 30 degrees is 1 over 2, 1 half. And I can see that this point, you know, the opposite side is 1 half. And on my unit circle, you know, this hypotenuse, this radius of the circle is 1, so 1 half over 1. My sine ratio is 1 half. Now, if I were to set that to 5 pi over 6, I also get a 1 half on my sine function. So it's you know, it's gone from here at 1 half and it's gone all the way to here at 1 half, right? And that's because at 150 degrees, 5 pi over 6, um, there is also another reference angle, a 30 degree angle here, right? With a opposite side of 0.5 over my, over my hypotenuse of 1, so 1 half again. Let me just do 7 pi over 6. Again, now we're at 210 degrees. Well, at 210 degrees, or 180 plus 30, we have another reference angle of 30 degrees with a opposite side of 1 half divided by 1, or 1 half. But this is, you know, negative 1 half. We're going down on the y-axis, negative 0.5. And that's why we've gone on the sine function, we've gone negative to this point. Okay, so at 210 degrees, 7 pi over 6, you know, our sine function is at negative 0.5 when we plot to this point. So it's kind of cool. That's a great way of, of looking at it. Let's explore it in a little bit more detail. Let's take a look at graphing the sine function and its reciprocal cosecant function. The description for this video includes a link to the interactive lesson, or you can go to the Math Coach Me site, and then you can go to the lessons, and you'll find it in our trigonometry series, Trigonometry 5, Graph, Sign, and Cosecant Functions. Okay, before we get into the meat of this lesson on graphing the sine and cosecant function, uh, just let's explore sinusoidal waves and some of their applications. So, you know, besides being a really good looking function, you know, it's got that nice rolling pattern, those nice smooth curves, you know, as it's, as it's going through its various angles. Um, there are a lot of applications, certainly in engineering and architecture, but, you know, think of natural phenomena, you know, think of, um, well, looks like the waves of an ocean, but think about the tidal wave coming in and going out. Uh, also applications in modeling sound waves, uh, light waves as well, and, you know, anything mechanical, okay, anything that has an oscillatory uh, motion that goes round and round and round. Think of a Ferris wheel. You'll probably see some Ferris wheel problems related to trigonometry, you know, on your various tests and exams. So lots of applications for sinusoidal waves. Sinusoidal wave, waves are the sine function and the cosine function as well, which has a similar pattern. Okay, let's get into this lesson on graphing the sine function. So before you can solve those problems on your test or your exam, those modeling problems, like to uh, model a Ferris wheel that um, goes once around every 60 seconds and it has a radius of 15 meters, before you can model that with a sine function, 
you must be able to first draw the base function, the sine function, right? Before you can solve any of those sine transformation problems, you must be able to first you know, graph or draw the sine function. So you're going to need some graph paper. Um, and typically, you know, once you've done this a few times, you just go right to the graph paper, right? You know where the key points are. You just plot those points and then you draw your function. But the first couple of times, it's useful to fill out a table like this, okay? So we've got a row for our angles, okay? So for theta, we have angles at zero degrees and 30 degrees and 60 degrees and 90 degrees and so on, all the way through to two pi or 360 degrees, once around the circle. That is the period of the sine function, the period in which the sine function does not repeat. After that, it just repeats and repeats and repeats over and over and over again. So uh, once you've plotted or once you've completed your table and you've gotten all of these sine function values, okay, so you can get these right from your calculator and you fill out this table, then you take those values to your graphing paper. On your graphing paper, you're going to want to mark on your y-axis, your sine theta axis, you're going to want to mark uh, from 1 to minus 1, but you'll also want an area for, you know, 1 half and minus a half, right? And on your x-axis or your theta axis, you're going to want to mark or you're going to want your grid uh, to be labeled so that you've got, you know, 90 degrees identified and 180 and 270 and finally 360. I like to divide my grid paper, my grid marks, um, in, in 30 degree increments. So I'm going to divide each 90 by 30 degrees. So I've got, you know, a place for pi over 6 or 30 degrees and pi over 3 or 60 degrees and then 90 and so on, right? Once you've got your grid paper all labeled up, then you can go ahead, read from your table. Okay, so at angle zero, the sine theta value for that is zero. So you just plot that point and you plot each and every one of these points. At 30 degrees, it's one half. At 60 degrees, it's approximately 0.87. Okay, and you just mark all these points. At 90 degrees, it reaches its maximum of one and so on. Plot each and every point. Now, after, you, after you've done that, then you simply draw your line to join all of these. And I was thinking of doing this live for you, but it probably took me about 20 takes just to draw this one. So I'm not going to bore you with that, right? Once you've gone through your complete period, where it doesn't repeat from 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 360 degrees, then you just complete then you just repeat the pattern, okay? So up again, over an, another 90 degrees, it, it meets, reaches its maximum, another 90 degrees, back to zero, and so on, okay, in both directions. Now, once you've done this once or twice, you know, you can forget about the table, you're just going to the key points, okay? So you're going to plot immediately the key points. So I will, whenever I'm drawing a sine graph, I'm going to plot it at zero, and at zero, we have a positive slope on the sine function, right? 90 degrees over from that, it reaches its maximum, so I plot my second point there. 90 degrees over from that, at 180 degrees, it reaches, its, it reaches zero again, so I'll plot a point there, and then I'll plot another point, at 270 degrees at minus 1, and then I'll plot a fifth point at 2 pi, okay, 360 degrees back to 0, okay? With those key five points and, you know, approximating where 1 half is going to be, okay, you know, where it's going to cross at 30 degrees, one third of 90 degrees, approximating where that is, I can start to draw my continuously curving sine function, okay? So that's typically how I would do it. Okay, just let's wrap this section up with the properties of a sine function. So the domain is, you know, theta is equal to all theta or x, depending on what you're using for your sine function, is all real numbers, okay? So it just goes on and on and on 
to positive infinity, negative infinity, both ways. The range is from minus 1, greater than or equal to minus 1, and less than or equal to 1. The period is 2 pi, okay? So I've got that marked here from pi over 2 to 5 pi over 2. You might be wondering why I didn't go from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, that's the period. The period is the complete cycle of the function where it does not repeat. OK, so um, the convention is, you know, if you're asked to mark the period, graph a sine function and mark its period, uh, the convention is to mark it at its peaks, OK, at its highest values, OK, at 1 and 1 again at 5 pi over 2, OK? So uh, last point here is the amplitude. So the absolute amplitude is the distance from the x-axis or theta axis. Okay, so that's one in both directions. Okay, we're going to borrow the unit circle again, and a we're going to use a Desmos calculator to get a deeper understanding of the sine function and how it's graphed. So first off, um, a reminder from our unit circle lesson, you know, we saw this calculation. So we know by Sokatoa that sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, but on the unit circle with a radius of one, the hypotenuse is equal to one, right? The radius of the circle. Right. So in the case of opposite over hypotenuse, well, the opposite side, well, that's kind of this for this point here, that intersecting point. That's this the y value. OK, the height or the y value of this opposite side. So opposite over hypotenuse is y over hypotenuse. Hypotenuse is one y over one. Y is equal to sine theta. And that's why I can plot this point where this angle or the vertice of this triangle uh, marking this theta angle where it intersects with the unit circle, I can mark it here using this label, okay? So for the y value, I'm just using sine of theta, okay? Opposite over hypotenuse, y is e y over 1, y is equal to sine theta, okay? And similarly, I can mark the x-axis or the x-coordinate with cos theta, okay? Cos theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. It's this x value over 1, x equals cos theta, okay? So I can use that there. Now, for this here, first of all, I guess I should have mentioned that this, here's our sine function in red, okay? So here's the function, f of theta equals sine theta. And this point is being plotted with, this set of coordinates, okay? And the coordinates are theta, okay? Whatever angle value theta is along that x-axis, that theta axis, and for y, the function of theta 1, okay? So we have theta 1 and function of theta 1 to mark that point on our sine function. Okay, let's explore more detail. Let's maximize this and take a look at it. Okay, so theta 1 is marked here in our unit circle, so it is this angle in our unit circle, and I have a slider to control that, and it's set to increment in 30 degree in increments. So currently, theta 1 is set to pi over 6. This is in radians, but I've got a conversion here, so that's 30 degrees at pi over 6. And at 30 degrees, the sine of 30 degrees, well, we know this from our special triangles lesson, sine of 30 degrees is 1 over 2, or 0.5. And if I were to, um, well, just before I increase that, you know, if I, if I look at that plotted point on our sine function, okay, so our sine function is in red, and I've got this red labeled point here. So at 30 degrees, at 30 degrees, uh, pi over 6, on our sine function, for our sine function, we plot that at 0.5. If I increase this to 60 degrees, okay, so at 60 degrees on our sine function, pi over 3, we see that our sine function re returns 0.866, and I can see that here uh, on this label, and I can also see that here, sine of theta is equal to 0.866. If I go up 
one another 30 degrees, I get to 90 degrees. This is the maximum point that is plotted on our sine function at 1. Okay, So at pi over 2, 90 degrees, our sine function is 1, and we can continue to increment. Okay, For the first half of our circle, okay, halfway around our circle, 180 degrees, okay, our sine function is positive. At 180 degrees, back to zero. And then from here to 2 pi, to complete the period, our sine function has gone negative. So all of these values are negative. So at 210 degrees, 180 plus 30, again, we have a reference angle of a 30 degree reference angle here. The sine of 30 degrees is 1 over 2, and we can see that here, okay, point, well, this is negative 0.5. It's negative 0.5 because the sine of 210 degrees in quadrant 3 here, using the reference angle of 30, okay, so the sine of 30 degrees is negative 0.5, okay, so this is negative 0.5 on our y axis, our y sine theta axis, okay, we can see that here. So negative 0.5 over 1, which is negative 0.5, and that's why our sine function has gone negative and will remain negative all the way around this circle through quadrant 3 and then quadrant 4. Okay, so proceeding along through quadrant 3, we get to 3 pi over 2, or 270 degrees, and that's where you would plot the lowest point on the sine function minus 1, okay? And then continuing on through quadrant 4, okay, it remains negative, and then finally at 2 pi completes the full cycle, the full period of our sine function. Okay, I'm going to scroll out a bit, and just want to see this between negative 2 pi and pi. Okay, so I'm going to just actually play this animation here. And I can see it just cycling through. It's, right now, it's actually decrementing by 30 degrees. So it's kind of moving backwards clockwise around the unit circle. OK. And continuing on to negative values in a clockwise fashion. And you can see all those key points. So at minus pi over 2, it's at minus 1. Back to 0 at pi, or minus 180. Up to 1 at three, minus 3 pi over 2. And then at minus 2 pi, back to 0. Okay, And then repeating now, going in a counterclockwise fashion. Okay, If I were to drop the increments, and play this animation. You see that continuous flow. So as our unit circle is going around and around and meet and hitting every single angle, you can see those angles plotted in a continuous curving fashion with our sine function. Okay. Okay. Just another way of looking at it. The Cosecant function is the reciprocal of the sine function. So cosecant of theta is 1 over sine theta. So where sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse, the cosecant of theta is hypotenuse over opposite. So where sine of 30 is 1 over 2, the cosecant of 30 degrees is 2 over 1. And we see that here. Cosecant of pi over 6, 30 degrees, is 2. OK, so just the inverse. And we see that for all of these values. So like when plotting the sine function for the first time, it's useful to plot a table of values in 30 degree increments. OK, so 0, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, and so on, right? Right through its complete period of 2 pi, or 360 degrees, once around the circle. OK. Uh, let's take a look at that graphically. Just before we do, what's with this undefined? Okay, we've got undefined points for our cosecant 
of theta. So at zero degrees, cosecant is undefined. Well, think of sine of zero degrees. Sine of zero degrees is zero. Sine of pi is zero. Sine of two pi is zero. So at all of these places, instead of you know, a value, we have undefined. There is a asymptote at those locations. Okay, so there are asymptotes at zero and pi and two pi. And just as a reminder, an asymptote is a line that a function approaches but never quite gets to. Okay, so at zero, we can see our cosecant function here in purple. It begins to shoot off into positive infinity. It's getting closer and closer and closer to uh, that y-axis, okay, uh, at zero, but it just never quite, get, quite gets there, okay? So we can see the plotted points from our table, for the points that could be plotted, right? We can see them plotted, and we can see that at 90 degrees, where our sine function is one, well, the reciprocal of one is one. So our two functions, sine and cosecant, intersect right at that point, at 90 degrees, okay, at one. And that's actually, you know, when you're graphing the cosecant function, the way I do it is first I graph the sine function. Okay, we know that at zero, the sine function is at zero. And then just in every 90 degree increment, we're up to one at 90, at 180, back to zero, at 270, down to negative one, and at 360, back to zero. So for the cosecant function, at one, this is the first, or sorry, at 90 degrees, you know, you plot it, the cosecant function at one, just as the sine function is one, the reciprocal of one is one, and then you plot from there. So, you know, at 60 degrees from our table, it's approximately 1.15, and at 30 degrees, it is two. Okay, so you can plot those points and get the shape of your parabola, okay? So we have actually two halves of this, okay? So we have one parabola going off into positive infinity, okay? Never quite getting there as it approaches, as your angle approaches zero and pi, and then going to negative infinity. So on the negative side, where our sine function is negative in this range here from pi to 2 pi, okay, from 180 to 360, basically the bottom half of your circle. So from that range there, the cosecant function, first at, at 270 degrees at 3 pi over 2, you would plot it at minus 1. So that's where our sine function and cosecant function intersect again at minus 1. And then you can plot it approaching, you know, uh, the pi value, 180 degrees, and as it does, it just shoots off into negative infinity in both directions in this parabola facing down, okay? All right, let's explore this. Oh, actually, just before we do, the properties of the cosecant function. So like the sine function, domain of all real numbers with a couple of exceptions, okay? With exceptions at, you know, any multiples of pi, any integer multiples of pi, okay, where those asymptotes occur. Uh, the range is um, less than, uh, less than or greater than negative one, okay, wherever the sine function is negative, wherever the cosecant function is negative, and wherever the sine function is positive, uh, it is greater than uh, or equal to one. Okay, so it just goes off into, you know, positive infinity in those positive areas for the cosecant function and goes off to negative infinity as it approaches any of those asymptotes. The period, like the sine function, is 2 pi. Okay, so we can see that at this maximum value and, the, well, not really a maximum, but at this point, right, where the cosecant function is 1 and 1 again, that's a 2 pi period. Okay, let's explore this a little further in this Desmos calculator. In this Desmos calculator, I have the sine function in red here, f of theta equals sine theta, and the cosecant function here in purple, g of theta equals cosecant theta. I also have a slider to control my theta angle, 
Okay, so I'll set it to 30 degrees to start our discussion there. So with theta equal to pi over 6 or 30 degrees, uh, here in our unit circle, I can see that we're at 30 degrees here. And the plotted point on our sine function is this, 1 half or 1 over 2. And on our cosecant function at 30 degrees, it's the reciprocal of that, 2 over 1. And if we move that to 60 degrees, okay, at 60 degrees, our sine function is at root 3 over 2, and um, our, which is approximately 0.866. And our cosecant function is at the reciprocal of that, or 2 over root 3, or approximately 1.55. And if we go to the next point of interest, this is a point of interest. So at 90 degrees of pi over 2, our cosecant function and our sine function have the same value of 1. So our two functions intersect at that point. In fact, that's the starting point. Well, that's a second step in graphing your cosecant function. First step, graph your sine function. Okay, at 0, it's 0. At 90 degrees, it's at its maximum 1. Back to 0 at pi at 180 degrees, 270 at negative 1, and then at 2 pi back to 0. Any points where you have zeros for your sine function, the reciprocal of 0 is undefined. You will draw your asymptotes, either physically or just mentally, you're going to draw them there. Okay, so your asymptotes at 0 and pi and 2 pi, and every integer increment of pi, okay, in both directions. So you would plot this point first, okay, right at pi over 2, 90 degrees, and 1. That is your intersecting point for your two functions. From there, you could plot the other points. Your cosecant function, while your sine function is positive in quadrants 1, in quadrants 2. While your sine function is positive, your cosecant function is positive. At 90 degrees, it's equal to 1. And then those parabolas slowly begin to go up, and then they just take off as you, know, you approach 0 for your angle, okay, from the positive side, or pi, or 180 degrees, from the less than 180 degree side, you know, as you're approaching those asymptotes, your cosecant function is just going off, shooting off into positive infinity. Okay. Now, as we cross over here, well, let me go back one. Okay. So here at, um, that looks like 150 degrees. So once again, we have a reference angle of 30 degrees. And at 150 degrees, your sine ratio is 1 over 2. Your cosecant ratio is 2 over 1. Okay, we can see that here. 1 over 2, 1 half for your sine function, and 2 for your cosecant function. Now, when I go to pi, where we have another asymptote, I lost my connecting line here because there is no corresponding point on your cosecant function, okay? So it, it approaches that as it shoots off into infinity, as that angle gets closer and closer to pi, but it never quite, get, quite gets there. Okay, as we go into the negative area of our sine function from 180 degrees to 360 degrees, in quadrant 3 and quadrant 4 of our unit circle. As we're going through these angles here, you know, we can see that our cosecant function, you know, first it starts off, you know, kind of at, you know, negative infinity, and then it's getting smaller and smaller until it gets here, okay, at negative 1. So at 270 degrees, 3 pi over 2, once again, for the second time within our period, our cosecant and sine function intersect, okay, this time at negative 1, okay? And it stays negative, and now it's approaching, once again, negative infinity, okay, until we get to 2 pi. And at 2 pi, again, we have an asymptote, so it gets, you know, further and further and further negative, right? approaching negative infinity as we're approaching 2 pi 
from less than 2 pi, right? But it never quite gets there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, maybe resize this a bit and I'm going to change this and play the animation. Okay, so let's just observe this for a moment. Okay, so our two functions, they just crossed at 90 degrees. They intersected at 90 degrees. Now watch what happens to the cosecant function. Whew, just kind of takes off. But it, and then it's coming from negative infinity. Wow, what's happening here? So uh, this is going to go on to 2 pi. So it's as it's approaching 2 pi, now it's in the negative zone, so it's going to approach negative infinity as it gets closer and closer and closer to 2 pi. And then our dotted line, boom, well, we didn't quite get to 2 pi. So it was less than 2 pi, right? I think we'll see that again as we approach pi. So this time as we're approaching pi on the negative side from greater than pi, right? It's going to shoot off into negative infinity, and then it's going to disappear at that one point. Boom, it's gone, okay? And now it's coming from positive infinity. So that's going quite a, kind of quick. You can slow this down. You can watch this as long as you like. Go to the Math Coach Me site. Interact with this directly. Uh, but again, another perspective on the cosecant function, how it relates to the angles in your unit circle all the way around the circle, and how it relates to your sine function as well. That concludes this lesson on graphing the sine and cosecant function. Be sure to like this video and to follow the Math Coach Me channel. Also, be sure to check out the corresponding interactive lesson. So there's a link to uh, that interactive online lesson uh, right in the video description. And uh, this is actually a graphic or a Desmos calculator from the next lesson. In the next lesson, we're going to take a look at graphing the cosine and its reciprocal secant function. And this is showing a cosine function in blue. We have a unit circle. And once again, we can see the interaction of the angles as we're rotating around that unit circle and where they're being plotted on the cosine function. You know, a little different from the sine function. It's kind of like one of them old school locomotives. So be sure to check out that video and we'll see you again.